Hi, everyone. So today we are going to be doing our second lecture on light. And this is, again, related to plant growth and development. But first, we are going to review. So in last lecture, we looked at light in response to plant growth and development. And we said that light, we started by defining light. We said that light is a type of electromagnetic magnetic radiation, which is just energy that moves through space in waves. And it is the wavelength or the distance from crest to crest in that wave or in those waves that is going to determine the type of energy that we see, right? And that spectrum includes stuff from gamma radiation to X-rays, infrared, UV, as well as visible light. And if we are looking at the visible light spectrum, we'll see that that wavelength is also going to affect the color of light that we see with shorter wavelengths being towards the blue spectrum or the purple and blue spectrum, and longer wavelengths being towards the red spectrum, right? And if we were talking about the light that is emitted from the sun, our solar spectrum, we see that it's about 2% UV, 47% visible light, and 51% infrared. Now, light is critical for plants because light is needed for photosynthesis. And photosynthesis is this hugely important process by which plants are creating sugar from carbon dioxide. It's really amazing. They are taking carbon that exists in a gaseous form, in the form of carbon dioxide, and they're able to take that carbon and fix it or turn it into a sugar molecule. And for this process to occur, they need the carbon dioxide and they need to use water and then they need energy from light. And we refer to that energy as photons, which are essentially just little packets of light energy. And that through that process creates our glucose molecule or our sugar molecule, C6H12O6, and oxygen is produced as a byproduct. And that is so important again, right? Because ultimately it's this process of photosynthesis that is going to affect the yield and the quality of our plants. It's going to affect the, the amount of growth that they're able to do. It's going to influence how fast they move through their life cycle. So it's going to influence their development. And thus, any factor that affects photosynthesis is also going to affect plant growth and development. Those are two critical points there, right? Photosynthesis is the primary thing that's going to affect our plant growth and development, our yield, uh, the productivity of our plants. So anything that affects that is also going to affect plant growth and development. And that's because that glucose molecule is utilized in so many different ways, right? It is broken down for energy. So everything that is going to require energy, all these metabolic processes, the input of nutrients into our plant, etc., anything that needs energy, it's going to need that our plant needs that glucose molecule to break it down. And photosynthesis is the process by which we are creating that glucose molecule. Now, we then looked at the section of light or the area of light that is important for our plants. And we said that it is the photosynthetic active radiation. And this is the range of the range of light from 400 to 700 nanometers, right? And this is what is utilized by our plants for photosynthesis. And we looked at a little bit of how we figure that all out, right? But that's the takeaway that photosynthetic active radiation or PAR is the range of light that is utilized by our plants for photosynthesis. And it goes from 400 to 700 nanometers, right? From blue light to red light, essentially. Now, historically, when we were measuring how much light plants need, we historically came up with a measure of lumens, which is a way of quantifying light, right? Or quanta or or determining the light quantity, right? Because if we want to know how much light plants need, we need to have a measure of light quantity or how much light is being produced by a lighting source, whether it's the sun or an artificial light lamp, etc. And that traditionally, we base that measurement of light quantity on the lumen, which is just the brightness of a candle, of a single candle, right? So the brightness that we see from a single candle is a lumen. And from that measurement, we developed foot candles and lux. Now, a foot candle is if you took that a single candle, so a single lumen, and you held it a foot away from a wall and you had outlined a one foot squared or one foot by one foot uh, square on that wall, the light 
that would be illuminated on that one foot by one foot square by holding this candle a foot away from the wall would be the one foot candle. The intensity of light would equal one foot candle, right? And that's a way of measuring light quantity. Lux, very, very similar idea. It's like the metric form of it. So instead of having that candle a foot away, it's a meter away. And the brightness of light that illuminates a meter squared circle on that wall would be equivalent to lux. And that is how we were able to measure light quantity. The problem with that, as we learned about in lecture, is that lumens are based on our visual perception of our light. And our visual perception does not do a good job of being able to quantify the light in the spectrum around 400 or above or near 700, right? It doesn't do a good job of quantifying blue light and red light. Thus, if we are basing the effectiveness or the quantity of light of a certain light source based on lumens, it may not do a good job or it's not going to include the full range of light that are important that is important for our plants. Thus, we developed that photosynthetic active radiation and we developed two other measurements that are more accurate in determining how good a light source is for our plants. And those are photosynthetic photon flux and photosynthetic photon flux density. Now, photosynthetic photon flux is a measurement of PAR, right, that photosynthetic active radiation, so light in those wavelengths between 400 and 700 nanometers. It's a measure of that PAR that is being produced every second. And then photosynthetic photon flux is that PAR that's being produced every second uh, landing on a meter squared area, right? So the amount of uh, photosynthetic active radiation in micromoles per second is how it is, uh, or is the notation, the amount of that that is landing on a meter squared area every second, right? And that is essentially the version of lux, but instead of using lumens, we are utilizing uh, photosynthetic active radiation. So it's a much better measurement of the light that is important for our plants because our plants need that entire 400 to 700 nanometers. Uh, they utilize it all for photosynthesis. Now, knowing that, how much of that light energy do our plants actually need? Well, different plants will vary in their PPFD needs or responses, right? It's going to be dependent on the plant. But in general, if we need a general number, we see that uh, around 1,000 PPFD is going to be really maximize our plant growth or our yield as a, on average, right? Different plants are, are, have different light needs. For example, I gave the example of lettuce needing less light. Um, cannabis or corn uh, can do better with more light, right? So as you increase light or PPFD values, you're generally seeing corresponding increases in photosynthesis and then increases in plant growth and yield up until around that 1,000 PPFD for on average for a lot of plants. But again, if you go past that, depending on the plant, you may see further increases, or you may even start to see some decreases if it's something like lettuce, right? That too much light could be a problem. So PPFD is a really good value, but it's only telling us the amount of photosynthetically active radiation or that PAR value that is landing on the plant per second. And that does us no good, right? Because even if our plants are getting a thousand par, but it's only getting it for five or 10 seconds, it's not gonna be helpful for our plant in the long term. So what we really need is a measure of that PPFD value over the course of 24 hours, over the course of a day. And that measurement is referred to as the daily light integral. So this measures our PPFD over 24 hours. And the equation is quite simple. You take your PPFD value, you multiply it by the times of hours of light that you've observed, right? Or that was, um, if you're growing indoors, it's particularly, it's much easier. And then you multiply that by a constant of 0 0.0036. And that's just the constant that you get when you transfer seconds to hours, right? And if you get that, you will get a value and that's gonna give you your daily light integral value. And that's helpful because we know that there are optimum values for different species. And in general, if you're above 14 for that daily light integral, you're gonna be producing good plants in terms of yield, right? Or, or growth or productivity. 
Anything above that, above 20 is even better. If you get towards maximizing, like if you get up to that 1,000 PPFD, you're going to get values that are around 50 to 40, which is very, very hot. So we know how much light we need in general. Then the last thing we looked at are the effect of different colors. So the effect of those different wavelengths. And what we found is that they don't really affect plant growth or productivity or yield in any significant way, right? We I looked briefly at cannabis and it, it didn't affect the amount of flower bud that was produced or the uh, amount of cannabinoids that were produced. But what it does do is the different lights can affect plant shape. So blue light generally makes our plants shorter. Green light was really good for identifying plant problems, like right? nutrient deficiencies or any sort of deficiencies. We need to see that in the leaves and green light is important to utilize so we can see that. Red light does improve photosynthesis a bit or is a little bit more efficient for photosynthesis, only about 15%, right? So you do get a little benefit with, with increased red light. And we saw that far red light makes our plants taller. Right, so blue light makes them shorter, far red light makes them taller. So these different wavelengths are, are impacting our plants in different ways. And far red light is light beyond that 700 nanometer. So something around 740 or 750, nano, 750 nanometers. But we also saw that when we include far red light, we get this unique effect called the Emerson effect, where we improve photosynthesis even more than what we would expect. And it's because of this that we've now developed this EPAR, which is the range from 400 to 750 nanometers. So we've extended the PAR to include that section of far red light due to the benefit that we see with this Emerson effect in photosynthesis. So that is that. Let us now continue with the rest of our light lecture. So in this lecture, we are going to be focusing on three responses that plants have towards light photomorphogenesis, phototropism, and photoperiodism. And we are going to start with photomorphogenesis, which is a change in the shape or form of a plant due to light. We just talked about how important light is, right, in our review and in last lecture, about why light is so important for our plants, right? It is needed for photosynthesis, and that is the process where we're taking carbon dioxide or our plants are taking carbon dioxide from the air and creating a sugar molecule or glucose molecule. And it's that that is going to provide the energy for our plants to do all their metabolic processes and to grow and develop. So light is critical for our plants. And accordingly, shade then is a big threat to our plants, right? If they begin to be shaded out and they can't have access to the light, it's going to affect their photosynthesis and it's going to affect their growth and development and then ultimately could lead to their death. Thus, our plants have evolved a shade avoidance response. And this is particularly true for plants that have adapted to growing in open fields, which most of our crop plants have, right? And they, they have adapted, right? That is, they, they evolved to grow in open fields. And what this photomorphogenesis is, is that you can see there is a difference between plants that are grown in full sun, which is the plant you see on the left, and plants that are grown in shade. So plants that are grown in full sun are particularly are generally more compact, they are branchier, and they'll have darker green leaves because there's more chlorophyll that is being synthesized because more photosynthesis is taking place. And we can compare that to a plant that is grown in shade. Now, in, when a plant is grown in shade, it's generally taller and spindlier, right? It'll have reduced branching. And there'll be less chlorophyll synthesis, so it'll be a more pale green, right? Not that darker green that you see on the left. So how does this process work, right? How do our plants, how are they able to sense sunlight versus shade? Well, the first thing that we need to know is that the light quality is different in sunlight versus shade. And again, when I'm talking about light quality, I mean the wavelengths of light that are going to be able to reach the plant are different if that plant is in full sun that you see here or if that plant is shaded out in a forest canopy. And what's particularly important is the amount of red light versus the amount of far red light. So if we look up here, the amount of red light is this region right around here. So 
It's centered around 670 nan... Oh, hold on. 670 nanometers wavelength. Right? So that's still in the visible light spectrum. So that's red light, and that's important for plant photosynthesis. And then the amount of far red light is just about over here. And that is centered around 730 nanometers. So within a full sun, within full sun, the amount of red light that is able to reach a plant, so we had our theoretical plant growing right here, the amount of red light compared to far red light is about 1.2 to 1, right? Or about 55% red light to 45 uh, far red. Right, so there's more red light that is going to reach our plant than far red light. In a shaded area like this, because that red light gets absorbed by other plants for photosynthesis, the amount of far red light drastically increases. So there's going to be more far red than red. Okay, so we know light quality is different in full sun versus a shaded environment. What our plants have been able to do is they have what is referred to as the phytochrome phytochrome pigment system. And this system is very important because it's able to sense can sense both red light and far red light. You can see it here, and what's interesting about this phytochrome pigment system is that it has two pigments that are interconvertible, right here. So we have phytochrome pigment system, we have two pigments, sorry my handwriting is awful, we have PR and PFR. So PR senses red light. PFR senses far red light, right? So this phytochrome pigment system, there are two types of pigments within our plants within this system. There's the PR, which is going to sense our red light, so this region right here. And there's the PFR that is going to sense our far red light. Now what's neat about this system is that these two pigments are interconvertible, so they can conv you can convert one into the other. So when this PR pigment senses red light, it gets turned into PFR, and vice versa. When this PFR pigment senses far red light, it gets turned back into PR. This also occurs during nighttime in darkness, right, naturally. So why is this important? Well, this system allows the plant to determine, essentially, the light quality in an area. Because you can think about it, if you are in an area where there's more red light, so in a sunny area, your plant is going to pick up more, it's be able to sense more red light, because there's more red light available than far red light, and your PR is going to be converted into PFR, right? So in a sunny area, you're going to have more of this far red light photo, uh, phytochrome. As opposed to a dark or shaded area, where there's going to be more far red light. Remember, here's our shaded area. The red light is getting absorbed by other plants. Far red light is able to pass through, so you're going to have more far red light, so more of this PFR is going to absorb more far red light, and that's going to convert it to P, to regular PR. Right, so in a, dry, in a dark shaded area, you're going to have more PR. 
why this is important and how this affects plant growth and development is that this PFR is a, referred to as the active form. And what it does is this PFR travels from the cytoplasm of the plant. We'll say that it travels into the nucleus. Nucleus. And there it interacts with transcription factors. Those proteins, transcription, sorry my handwriting is awful. Transcription factors. Those proteins that turn genes on and off. And it interacts with those transcription factors and it results, that turns on a whole host of genes. Those turn on genes to make the plant grow a certain way. And in this case, it makes the plant grow shorter, branch, ear, if that's a word, uh, and more chlorophyll. Right? So what's happening when you have more of this PFR in the plant, this is an active form of this phytochrome pigment. It's gonna to travel to the nucleus. It's gonna interact with transcription factors there. Those transcription factors are gonna turn on a bunch of genes that are gonna make our plant to grow in a certain way. And it's gonna make our plant grow shorter, branchier, with more chlorophyll because it's an indication that our plant is growing in full sunlight, right? In full sunlight, there's more red light that's shining down that's converting more of our PR to PFR than vice versa, right? So it knows it's growing in sun and the plant is gonna grow in response to that. If you are in a situation where there's more far red light than red light, right? Or, if, or you're in darkness, your PFR here, there's gonna be more PFR that is gonna sense that far red light and it's gonna be converted into PR and that PR is the inactive form. So it's not, it's not gonna interact with these transcription factors. It's not gonna turn on these genes that are gonna change the way it grows. And in response, our plant is gonna grow tall and spindly, right? Because essentially our plant is able to sense that it is in this dark or shaded out environment. And it's gonna try and grow in response to that. So it's gonna grow taller to try and get above whatever is shading it out. All right, so that is photomorphogenesis. And I have a quick lab video where I'm actually gonna show you this uh, in a little experiment that I did. So this here we have photomorphogenesis in action. So I have a little makeshift experiment that I set up and I germinated a couple of those pea seeds that we had couple that I had left over and I set up two treatments one there in the back where they were grown under full light conditions and then this treatment in the front if you can see it that is grown under shade and if you look I'm going to remove this now you could see that there are marked differences between these guys that were grown in the shade and these guys that you can't even see back there that were grown in the light so let me going to remove this one and we'll look at these two. And I have some microgreens mixed in there just by accident. But these guys were planted at the same time. They germinated at the same time. So when I put that shade up, they were all the same, for the most part, the same height in terms of their stem. And you can see here the big difference that we see in the morphology of our plants that were grown in full sun they are shorter, they're a little more branched out, they have darker leaves, as opposed to our plants that were grown in the shade where they have longer stems, less branching, and less dark leaves, lighter color leaves, right? So that chlorophyll production isn't as prominent as it is over here, right? So that is an actual example that we've shown of photo photomorphogenesis. Next, I want to talk about phototropism. 
So phototropism is the movement of a plant in response to light. And you've all probably seen this if you've grown plants or you've been around plants, house plants in a home, where you may have them sitting on a windowsill and you see that over time that plant begins to bend towards the window. It's bending towards the light. Now this process is regulated by phototropism or phototropin, a blue light receptor, right? Our phytochromes are looking for red light and far right, uh, far red light receptors. Phototropin is a blue light receptor. Now, most plants show a positive phototropic response where they're gonna bend towards that light. However, there are some plants do show a negative phototropic response where they'll bend away from the light. And you may see these in the roots of some species. So how is this process occurring, right? Well, what is happening is that the phototropism, phototropin, I'm having a hard time saying that, phototropin is detecting blue light coming from uh, whatever angle it's coming from or side of the plant, right? So that phototropin is detecting that and that releases auxin on the dark side of the plant or dark side of the stem. And auxin is a plant hormone and one of its functions is to elongate cells. So that auxin builds up on the dark side and those cells, it causes those cells to elongate. And when those cells elongate, they push the plant in the, to, into the direction of the light, right? And that is how this process works. Now there is a particular type of phototropism called heliotropic movement in which a plant will track the sun's motion across the sky. Now, this is related to the change in the angle of incidence of sunlight, is that the angle in which the sunlight strikes a surface will impact the intensity of that light. So if, there, if it is impacting at a 90 degree angle, it is hitting the smallest surface area. So it's gonna have more light energy and more heat. It's gonna produce more light energy and more heat. That is why it's hotter at the equator, right? If it's hitting at a uh, steeper angle or, or really a, a decreased angle in terms of what you see there uh, in the figure, right? It's going to, that same amount of light is gonna impact a larger surface area and it's gonna be less intense. It's gonna produce less energy at any one given spot and less heat, right? Again, why it's colder, as you get closer to the poles. Our plants that do heliotropic movement are able to take advantage of that and they can adjust their leaf angle or their stem angle and flower angle to uh, get either more energy and more heat or less energy and less heat throughout the day. And a good example of this is our sunflowers, right? And we've all probably heard of that idea it's probably where their name comes from right that they will track the movement of the sun across the sky and they're doing this uh when they actually did the research for this the reason they're actually doing this is they are trying to produce more heat in their flowers and the reason is because it turns out that bees like heat right they're more attracted to the hot flowers so they are um changing their angle to become uh so to get more light energy and thus more heat that heats up the flowers and it attracts more bees and it increases their pollination so it's an adaptation uh, for reproduction really now the last um process or response that we're going to look at is photoperiodism now photoperiodism is a morphological response to variations in day length or a developmental response to variations in day length Oftentimes we are talking about flowering when we are talking about photoperiodism, but there are other um, developmental stages or processes that are triggered by this, including the formation of bulbs, tumors, and corms, our storage organs, right, and stolons as well, which are um, above ground horizontal stems. <clears throat> they can all be controlled by photoperiods. Now, there are three major response types of plants. There are day neutral plants that do not respond to photoperiods. Then there are long day plants <clears throat> that have some developmental process. And for ease, I'm just gonna say flowering, All right? So there are long day plants that will flower when daylight is longer than some critical day length. And there are short day plants that will flower when daylight is shorter than a critical day length. 
Critical day length is not a standard measurement. Different plants have different critical day lengths. And for example, the critical day length of red clover is 12 hours, while the critical day length for a hardy chrysanthemum is 15 hours, right? Very different times. Now, red clover is a long day plant. Thus, it is gonna flower when day length is longer than 12 hours, right? It, once that day length it gets longer than that critical day length, in this case, 12 hours, that plant is going to flower. Hardy chrysanthemum, on the, on the other hand, is a short day plant. Thus, it is only going to flower when day length is shorter than that critical day length. And for Cardi chrysanthemum, that critical day length is 15 hours. So when the day length gets below 15 hours, it's going to flower. Now, critical day lengths are related to the summer solstice, which is the longest day of the year. Where we're at, that's typically June 21st or June 20th. So your long day plants are going to respond before that summer solstice, because leading up to the summer solstice, days are getting longer. Right. So as the days are getting longer, at a certain point, it's going to surpass the length of day is going to surpass that critical day length for whatever that plant is. Say the red clover, the days are going to get longer than 12 hours, and that's going to trigger our red clover to flower. Now, your short day plants, their response, their responses are initiated after the summer solstice. Right. So the days have been getting longer. They're longer than 12 hours. Our red clover is flowering. Ultimately, we get to the summer solstice. And then our days start getting shorter again. And when they get below, day length gets below 15 hours, it's going to trigger that hardy chrysanthemum to start flowering, right? Now it's after that summer solstice. And now when we get below that critical day length, all of a sudden our hardy chrysanthemum will start flowering. Now, when they first discovered this, they um, were looking at day length, right? And it's why they're named long day plants and short day plants. But it turns out that it's not really day length that is um, that is as important as the length of night, right? So it's really the length of night that is more important or, or interrupted length of night. So for our short day plants, they should really be called long night plants, but we're not changing the name because we've gone by short day plants for so long. But what they found is that, again, for your short day plants, right, they are gonna flower when um, day length is below a certain level, right? Or a certain day length, right? So for example, we'll talk about that hardy chrysanthemum again, right? When day length is below 15 hours, they'll start flowering. But what they found is that even if day length is below that 15 hours, if there is a flash of light during the nighttime, that plant will not flower, right? It's gonna prevent this process from occurring. And the opposite is true with your long day plants. Right. So your long day plants are really short night plants. Right. So again, we'll talk about our red clover. So as our days are getting longer, ultimately, at some point, they're going to get above the 12 hours and that will trigger them to flower. But if the days are still short, maybe it's still like a 10 hour uh, long day. If during the night there's a flash of light, it will also trigger this plant to flower. Really? So this is just to show that it's really the length of nighttime that is more important. However, when this was first discovered, it was discovered according to day length, and that's how we've kept it going, at least in terms of the name. So there's some other interesting things about photoperiodism. One is that our plants will fail to flower when placed under inducive light when leaves were partially removed. So we know the leaves are important for this process. Uh, Cockleburr, a short day plant exposed to long hours of light, still flowered if light was blocked from a single leaf, right? Again, so we know that the leaves are really important and there are some phytochromes present in the leaves that are detecting day length, but then how is that gonna impact your apical meristem? Because that's what's occurring, right? So something, the leaves are important and they're able to detect changes in day length, and then something needs to go to the apical meristem to switch that over to be from vegetative to reproductive and to be start producing flowers and reproductive tissue instead of more stem tissue. So for years, we searched for what is going on and we, we said whatever this magical substance was, we named it florigen, uh, it was some sort of stimulus, we thought it might be a hormone. And we again, we searched for this for about 70 years and could not find it. So what's going on? Well, it turns out 
It is a very complex process that involves the circadian rhythm of the plant, several different light receptors, and a lot of transcription factors. And I'm going to include in, uh, to end this uh, lecture, I'm going to include at least the process that we worked out for uh, a single plant. Now, this is very complex. I don't expect you to know this for an upcoming test, but I do want to show you the process to um, really give you an appreciation for the complexity of what is going on and the different hierarchy and levels of regulation that are occurring um, from a relatively simple setup, right? It, there's, there's a lot of genetic control that is that is occurring. And really, when we learned about genes, it's really just these nucleic acid bases, four of them, that are creating, uh, that are coding for proteins, that are creating traits. But built into that is all these levels of uh, control or hierarchical, hierarchical levels of control that allow for these complex, complex processes to occur. Um, so with that, I'm going to show you at least how this process was worked out for um, uh, some plants. And after that, that'll be the end of the lecture. Okay, so the mechanism of photoperiodism has been outlined in some long day plants. And I'm going to go through it here. Again, you don't need to know this, but I just want to provide it to you uh, so you get an understanding of the process and kind of how, what I find interesting uh, about the process because it's so complex. But at its core, what we find is that the induction of flowering is the result of a gene, flowering locus T gene. And what happens is the more that this gene is expressed, the more, the faster that we, the plant is going to flower or it accelerates flowering. So what this means when I talk about gene expression, that's a process where we go through transcription and translation, where we go from a segment of DNA to create a protein, right? So this gene here is found in the cells in our leaves, right? And it gets expressed, so it starts making protein. We'll just call it uh, FT protein. And that FT protein travels to our apical meristem, and it results in changing that from a vegetative bud to a flowering bud, and that initiates flowering. Okay, now what controls this gene expression is CO protein. So there's another gene, a CO gene, and I'll say CO protein slash gene controls FT expression. So this CO protein is a transcription factor it turns it turns this ft gene on in this case right so co turns on ft gene so the co protein turns on this ft gene that ft gene once it's turned on it starts making this ft protein and that ft protein is going to result in flowers now what's happening is that this CO gene is affected by a number of other transcription factors and it's all and those in turn are regulated by uh, the circadian clock of the plant. So just like in humans we have a biological clock that kind of regulates us. We have different processes that occur in the morning versus the night, right? Same thing is occurring in our plants. So CO gene is regulated by other proteins and transcription factors, which in turn are regulated 
by plants circadian clock. And what keeps that plant's circadian clock are different uh, light receptors. Just like our phytochrome pigment system or the phytotropin, there are light receptors, primarily blue light receptors, that maintain this circadian clock in our plants. And some of them are called cryptochromes. So to get more specific, what's happening is in the morning, there are other transcription factors that are produced called cycling DOF factors, or just CDFs. And these CDFs prevent transcription of CO gene, right? So these CDFs that are produced in the morning uh, prevent the transcription of the CO gene. So they turn this off. So when the CO gene is off, it's not producing this CO protein. That CO protein is not then able to produce, to turn on the FT gene, and we're not getting this FT pro protein. That's going to result in flowers, right? Now, the... <laughs> expression of this CDF gene, so CDF genes, and there's multiple CDFs, CDF genes uh, expression are regulated by additional transcription factors such as CCA1 and LHY. And this again are occurring in the morning, right? So in the morning, we these genes are active. Active. So the CCA1 gene and LHY gene are active, and this is regulated by these light receptors. And they produce these CCA1 and LHY proteins, which are transcription factors that then turn on the CDF genes. The CDF genes produce CDF proteins, which are transcription factors, that prevent the transcription of the CO gene. And when this is not turned on, it doesn't produce CO protein, which doesn't turn on the FT gene and doesn't create flowers, right? So this is keeping uh, the plant from flowering. Now, in the afternoon, when the plant can sense the uh, changing daylight, we have the production of different transcription factors in the PRR family. And I'll just put trend. I'll write it out, transcription factors. Now these guys stop the production of CDF and CCA1 and LHY. Okay. So in the morning, these things are preventing the uh, transcription of this CO gene. It's preventing the production of this CO protein transcription factor. But in the afternoon, the production of different transcription factors stop the production of the CDF genes, as well as the CCA1 and LHY. So it shuts this stuff all off. And as a result, we can start to have a buildup of our CO protein in the afternoon. So that's a good thing. That's going to start leading potentially to flowering. Now, this is all dealt with the really turning on and off of the gene, right? So these things prevented this gene from turning on to making protein. 
these things, these PRRs, turn these off, etc. We also have uh, what is referred to as post transcriptional regulation. And I'll get over to here. And we can do Whoops. So we, in the morning, we had morning we had the production of all those cdfs and those cdfs are preventing the co gene and these guys are preventing co gene expression and co protein as a result And this is occurring in the morning, right? And then we said in the afternoon, we start to see a stop and we reduce the production of these CDFs. But these proteins are still, still present in the afternoon. And they can still bind to those regions of DNA and prevent production of the CO protein. So we have some other sort of regulatory processes that are going on. And what is happening is the um, the degradation degradation of CDF protein is uh, controlled by two other proteins F. KF1 and GI. And again, the production of FKF1 and GI is regulated by Cadian clock. Okay, so we have these CDF proteins. They're preventing the uh, expression of the CO gene. They're preventing the CO protein from being uh, created, and that's preventing uh, the flowering locust gene product from being created and preventing flowering. So how this works is FKF1 and GI are produced separately. But on long days... FKF1 absorbs blue light and that activates it and it allows it to uh, then combine with GI. And it's this combination, it's this FKF1 and GI combination that will break down the CDF protein. So you need the combination to, to occur. Where this, how this factors in, how long days factor into this, is that this FKF1 and GI expression or production, as I've been talking about it, uh, overlaps on long days. All right, so on long days, you only, once you get past that critical uh, day, day length, that threshold, is when you're going to see this overlap. And when this overlap occurs, these things will combine and they will break down that CDF protein. And when we break down that CDF protein, it allows for the production of the CO gene and the CO protein and the production of the flowering locus protein. Now, there's also some other things in play as well. So besides these FK1 and this GI, um, the CO protein itself Whoops, I don't know how that happened. Uh, la, 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 la. Itself um, can be stabilized 
poor degraded by mechanisms related to blue, red, and far red light. And I'm not going to go into them because it continues to get more and more complicated, but essentially the CO protein itself uh, can either be stabilized or broken down by various mechanisms that are related to uh, day length and the type of light that you'll see at different day lengths. So, to put it all together, if we go back. In order for our plants to flower, our, photo, our plants that respond to photoperiodism, particularly our long day plants, they need to express or produce this flowering FT protein from these FT genes. Now what's going to turn these FT genes on is a protein called CO protein. However, there are a number of things that, that prevent this CO protein from being produced. In the mornings, there is the production of the CDF proteins, which are produced by two additional transcription factors, and they prevent the production of the CO protein. Now in the afternoon, there's a different family of transcription factors that stop these CDF proteins and allow for this CO gene to turn on and start producing CO proteins. At the same time, if we get to a long day situation for our long day plants, we have the production of both FKF1 and GI, and on those long days, their production overlaps. And when their production overlaps, these two will combine and will form this complex that further breaks down any CDF protein that had been produced in the morning. And as that protein gets broken down further and there's no more CDF protein that's being produced, then we see an increase in this CO protein itself, and that CO protein is going to uh, turn these genes on, and we're going to see an increased expression, and then that is going to ultimately lead to flower.